I'm Mark Power, I'm a photographer based in Brighton on England's south coast. So I've been uh, trying to be a photographer for well over 40 years now. It's a kind of standing joke that I have with a few friends that um, what kind of pictures do you take is one of the most difficult questions to answer. But I suppose I would class myself as a documentary photographer. I studied painting at art school, but to me it felt somewhat elitist that you had to be trained to a certain extent to be able to look at some kinds of painting, some kinds of sculpture in the correct way. The story goes that I went to see a Mark Rothko exhibition and we've been taught how to look at a Rothko painting. If you look at it, if you focus behind the surface of the painting, you get this kind of wobbly effect. The painting starts to move in front of you and vibrate. So I did all that and it, that all worked. And then I left there and I went to see an exhibition by Don McCullin at the South Bank Centre. McCullin was one of only two photographers I'd heard of. I was in the room of McCullin's work about Biafra and it was me and a woman who was in floods of tears. And it struck me that photography was very democratic in that way. Again, I'm making leaps of faith here, but it's quite possible that she wasn't trained in photography, how to look at pictures or anything, but it just moved her. I think that got me thinking that the immediacy of photography, the way that it can communicate so clearly and effectively, was interesting. Not that I felt like I had anything particularly poignant or important to say at that moment, but, um, you know, I think it sowed a seed in my brain. Inevitably, my work has changed uh, over the decades that I've been doing it. At the beginning of the 80s, it was all handheld cameras. It was, it was a lot of decisive moments. The big shift for me came in around 1997 when I moved to large format cameras. It meant that I had to really concentrate on what I was doing, really think about what I was doing, but I could still just about afford to make a few mistakes or to take a few risks. And then when it got up to 10, 12 pounds a picture, we had young children, you know, we had to clothe our children and it was a matter of, you know, do I, I, I take four pictures or, or buy some clothes for the kids? That meant working digitally instead. But I've importantly tried to maintain this discipline that I developed over all those years um, using expensive film so that I don't make hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Because I like to have the relationship with the subject that I'm photographing actually at the time and think about how the best, where the best place to stand is, the best time to push the shutter, what the light is like, etc., etc. Very important part of what I do is this stillness in my pictures. I'm trying very hard to avoid any kind of movement. I try to make pictures which are absolutely still. If it appears that there's nothing happening in the pictures at all, they, they become more contemplative. I suppose I, there's a little bit of a leap of faith that I would hope that the viewers of my pictures, those who are interested, would want to spend a little bit of time with them. So they're not necessarily very immediate. There's very few so-called decisive moments anymore. They're kind of indecisive moments or moments in between moments. Mm -hmm. 
Although I try to make pictures which are as close to reality as possible, so I don't use wide angle lenses or filters or anything, everything I do is, is shot with a standard lens and I'm trying to get front to back focus as well, so the, the, the depth of field is very important to me. And if the time ever comes when I have some kind of retrospective or survey show, I think it will be possible to see themes developing that, that run through the entire body of work. But it's not necessarily one obsession that I have because I'm jumping around all over the place. The larger the format, the more realistic, in a way, the pictures become. So that you start to feel, especially if you make pictures at scale, you almost feel like you're there or that you can walk into the pictures. I like to stand at a certain kind of discrete distance most of the time from what I'm photographing. There's a kind of a distance between me and the subject. It's not very, it's not particularly intimate from the, from the point of view of physical distance. But there is an intimacy because of the way that the camera renders everything so sharply. Well, what you see behind me is um, the edit for Good Morning America Volume 4. So I've been working in the States since 2012. I've now worked on this project. I've worked in 49 of the 50 states. So I've, you know, I've, I've travelled extensively in the country. It will be the result of over two years of my life spent in the States. You know, nothing else I've done has come close to the amount of time that I would have put into this. I really explore a place because I'm interested in the way that spaces reveal themselves slowly when you're walking through them as opposed to when you fly by in a car and you see something interesting at the side of the road, you do a U-turn, you come back. Because those things kind of be, tend to be quite shouty, I suppose. Look at me, how interesting I am. And ultimately, I'm not particularly interested in Americana, which is often what that kind of thing is, at its widest sense. Um, but I'm interested in the more subtle things. I'm also interested in making pictures in places that don't seem to offer very much. Something which appears to be so utterly bland and banal and uninteresting, in a way, does offer the opportunity to make it, dare I say, more interesting by the act of photographing it. There's a kind of a truth to the pictures, that, that those kind of places. They're, they're not trying to be anything other than what they are. I'm also kind of drawn to those places. If I had to choose one picture which was sort of my iconic picture, I suppose, uh, which is not necessarily the same as my favourite picture, I don't think I have a favourite picture. I did a long project in Poland between 2004 and 2009, so it was just after they joined the European Union in 2004. In 2005, Pope John Paul II passed away and he was a Polish Pope. And he was also a very important figure politically in Poland. Me and my friend Conrad, we went down to the main square in, in Warsaw the day before the funeral was going to take place and I saw these big screens starting to be erected. And so I, I thought, I, I'm going to stand behind the screen, I'm going to get this photograph of the screen with the people watching it. That's all I could think of. So the next day I came along, I went, went did exactly, you know, stood where I thought I wanted to stand. I could see the image on my ground glass screen before I took the picture. Although it was interesting and it showed the screens with the people underneath, there was a, a gap between the last person in the, in the crowd and the bottom of the screen. So I looked at this and I thought, you know, what would happen if I closed that gap?
Then when I went to the lab some, probably a couple of weeks later, and picked up the contact sheets, I realised that it, it had worked. It, it really, I mean, it was better than I could have imagined because what happened was that they, it started to play tricks with your eyes because it felt like, because the people underneath the screen were darker than the back of the screens, which were white, they were jumping forward. Mm. So it played tricks with your eyes. So often people look at that picture and they don't know what they're looking at. They can't work it out. I realized that that small act of closing that gap totally transformed the picture. It was just a small thing, but it to one worked and the other didn't. I've got this real urge to make work where I live in Brighton. The work that I like most of all is by people who live locally to the place that they're photographing. I mean, I love the idea of somebody in a small town somewhere who hasn't got particularly expensive equipment, but goes out and makes work, which is very honest about the place that, and with knowledge about the place where they live. I'd much rather see that than, you know, the big wig photographer going in there and making something which looks more spectacular or more expensive equipment. It doesn't move me in the same way. All of that doesn't really make a lot of sense because, you know, what am I doing? I'm still chasing, to a certain extent, the exotic because I'm working in the States. I'm not working outside my own front door. Brighton is a very difficult place to photograph as well because it's over-photographed, you know. It's a, there's famously, there was in the 1970s, there was a, a man in a flat cap who'd been photographed by Tony Ray Jones Elliot Irwin, Andy and Berry on separate occasions. It was the same person, you know. So it even goes all the way back in history to being someone, a place which is well photographed. There's so many photographers that have been here. There is humour in my work. I don't think there's enough humour in photography, so I, I'm, I'm not afraid to take on serious subjects and, and you know, and try to find some humour in them where I, where I can. If I didn't have those moments, of those little lighter moments, that it, I think it would all, it needs those to lift it a little bit. So it is perfectly all right to smile at some of the pictures I make. I, I won't be offended. On the other hand, it's probably something I don't even think about too much. You know, I mean, I try not to take myself or my life too, too seriously. Mm -hmm.